There's a very special birthday being celebrated in America today by a man who many have forgotten. But those of us who love the spoken word, and particularly the golden days of radio, can never forget Norman Corwin. Corwin rose to prominence in the 1930s and 40s as the preeminent writer of radio drama. But the words he wrote for the actors were more than just scripts for radio plays. They were incredible prose. He's best remembered for two hour-long broadcasts. One on December 15, 1941, celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Bill of Rights. And yes, it was just a few days after Pearl Harbor. The broadcast was heard on all the major networks. All the great Hollywood stars were there. The original music was written by Bernard Herrmann. And you have to realize that everything was on time and live down the network line. And after you hear some of this, you'll note that the narrator is none other than Jimmy Stewart. In witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names, George Washington, President and Deputy from Virginia. <laughs> now, gentlemen, we are ready for your signatures by geographical progression north to south. The deputies from New Hampshire will please sign first. John Langdon. John Langdon. Nicholas Gilman. Nicholas Gilman. The delegates from Massachusetts. Good looking men, these are mostly Daniel lawyers. Two of them sergeants. Rufus King. The gentleman from Connecticut, please. William Broom there. William Broom of Delaware. Roger he did surveying for a while. Roger Sherman. Oh. And now our representative... Sherman, who just signed. Alexander he was a shoemaker Hamilton. before he studied Alexander law. Hamilton. The gentleman from New Jersey. William That's Lincoln. Washington calling the delegation. David Brearley. David Brearley. The gentleman from... The man behind Ben Franklin is Alexander Hamilton. Ben's getting old now. 81. Hey, he slept off and on throughout the whole convention. But when it was important to be awake, he was awake, all right, and active. Charles Coachworth Pinkney. Charles Coachworth Pinkney. Ah, there have been men assembled in a room before. William. But never to a greater purpose. The other. Well. Abraham Baldwin. Here comes the last to sign now. William Jackson, secretary. Well, I do. So, so, the Constitution has been drafted. Signed and presently will be submitted to the states for their approval. Now the convention's all relaxed now. There are handshakes, felicitations. Well, is everybody happy? Will they celebrate this close? Will Rufus King go home to Boston and be welcomed by a welcoming committee from the city? Will appreciative Virginians hoist James Madison on their shoulders and parade him through the streets, shouting, Father of the Constitution? Will a thumping band march up and down the town making a noise like this? No, there will be no band. And I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, the heart of every man and woman, nay, of every child in each and every one of our 13 states, from the rock-bound shores of Maryland to the golden sands of Georgia, to fill and swell with pride on reading the noble and glorious Constitution which our wise and prudent and far-sighted representatives in solemn assembly have framed and admitted to our glorious states for their approval. And I say to you... No. There will be no speeches. There will be no celebration. No confetti from the windows. Fireworks saluting cannon. Roses strewn beneath the coaches of the delegates. Instead... It was a grand and glorious hour in which Stewart and the actors explained how the Bill of Rights was written and how the Bill of Rights codified America's freedoms. You see, Norman Corwin was able to command all of that, getting Herman to write the music and the Hollywood stars to participate because of his incredible reputation for writing and producing quality radio. But Corwin is best remembered for what was broadcast on CBS the night of victory in Europe, on a note of triumph. It was narrated by the great Martin Gable, and it saluted the common men and women who had fought and died in World War II up to that point. Take a bow, G.I. Take a bow, little guy. 
The Superman of tomorrow lies at the feet of you common men of this afternoon. This is it, kid. This is the day. All the way from Newburyport to Vladivostok. You had what it took and you gave it. And each of you has a hunk of rainbow around your helmet. Seems like three men have done it again. What a note of triumph was so beautifully written and the narration exquisitely read by Martin Gable. At one point, Gable takes the listeners below the waves to tell men in a submarine that Hitler has surrendered, only to find that these men will never fight again. You who are these long months unreported, you who have been out of touch of any but the deep-sea angels of the Lord's Leviathan reserves, you who are resting, rest assured of this. Over your heads and above the sea, victory has risen like a sun and moves west as we tell these things to you. Periodically, throughout On a Note of Triumph, the narrator Martin Gable talks to a lone G.I. who represents all of the victors in the war to that point. At one point, the G.I. says, how much has the war cost us so far? Gable says it's more than just planes and supplies and K-rations. These costs are calculable and have no nerve endings and will eventually be taken care of by the federal taxes on antique cigarettes and excess profits. However, in the matter of the kid who used to deliver folded newspapers to your doorstep, flipping them sideways from his bicycle, and who died on a jeep in the Ruhr, there is no fixed price and no amount of taxes can restore him to his mother. On a Note of Triumph ends with a prayer, a prayer that the world will wake up and never let war happen again. Post proofs that brotherhood is not so wild a dream as those who profit by postponing it pretend. Sit at the treaty table and convoy the hopes of little peoples through expected straits and press into the final seal a sign that peace will come for longer than posterities can see ahead that man unto his fellow man shall be a friend forever This was the most listened to program in the history of American Network Radio. And the man who wrote it, Norman Corwin, turns 100 today. Fourteen years ago, I caught up with Norman Corwin and spent part of an afternoon with him. And one of the things I wanted to ask him is when he and those wonderful people were cranking all of this out at CBS, was it just a job? Or did he think his prose would last forever? Uh, I never thought the work was that singular or that durable and I wrote it for example I was asked by CBS to have an hour program ready for the night of victory in Europe well I I was doing a series they said please stop in the middle of it prepare because it may be soon so I did and I stopped and I, I worked hard on it and when it was broadcast I and it was finished I thought well you know I wiped the sweat from my brow and I thought well we got through that one I didn't just uh, didn't uh, fall on my face and uh, people seem to like it I listened to what Norman Corwin wrote and I see pictures that are unbelievable his choice of words he was indeed a fantastic poet in his era even Carl Sandburg once said that Norman Corwin was the best there was And when I talked to him in that interview a decade and a half ago, he was worried. Worried about the dumbing down of America and the loss of beautiful language. The poverty of language distresses me, and I'm very happy to hear you allude to it, because it's one of the the striking uh, lacks in the educational process today. This past weekend, the Writers Guild honored Norman Corwin There were 450 tickets on sale. 700 people wanted a ticket. An American treasure. A man who took the language and made it sing. A man who was at the heart and soul of the golden days of network radio.
I'm Dennis Daly.